Thank you so much, uh, Leah, for the very generous uh, invitation and introduction. Um, it's uh, an honor uh, for, for Carolyn and I to be here uh, to talk about our work. We are um, in uh, the Lenape people's um, land, and we want to acknowledge um, that as well. Um, so uh, next slide. Uh, today, uh, we have a few things going on. I'll kind of um, broadly introduce this topic of housing um, as uh, a vehicle for advancing health equity, um, really premised on a deeper understanding of uh, the pillars uh, of housing. Uh, and then Carolyn um, will uh, go over uh, the four pillars of housing in detail, as well as provide some historical and ongoing um, examples uh, of the links between housing uh, and health. Uh, and then uh, we'll set forward um, a vision for um, housing as a platform for health equity. Um, next slide. Let me just start um, by saying that every good uh, research um, kind of uh, program um, and, and even, you know, kind of eventual papers kind of start out with, with a story. Uh, and in this case, um, at least for me, the story began when I was doing um, research in people's homes and realizing that the interconnectedness between their experience and how people um, were uh, challenged in different ways around um, housing wasn't necessarily reflected in the literature. In the literature, you would think that, you know, some of these issues are really disjointed and isolated and self and kind of standing alone. In reality and in practice, they are very much tied together and in some ways kind of sources of tension. Uh, and then um, I was super fortunate uh, to have connected with Carolyn uh, Swope when she was um, a master's student in sociomedical sciences. Um, and while I had written on uh, the kind of pillars of housing um, in, in prior work, we worked together on really establishing um, this framework. Um, and she ultimately uh, wrote a thesis on this um, uh, on a kind of an earlier version of this, uh, and it was award-winning. And so I'm really happy about all of the things that she's gone on to accomplish um, and how this work is kind of resonating uh, in public health and environmental health circles. Uh, so let's just kind of um, really kind of lay this out. Part of the, you know, I mentioned this idea that um, some of the kind of components of housing um, were presented as really isolated, but they were also kind of ultimately also presented as kind of ahistorical and not fully contextualized in the lived experience of disadvantage. Um, and so this uh, framework allows us to look at um, housing um, and its structural roots, really appreciating the mechanisms through which structure then impacts housing, going deeper on the housing um, pillars, and then really seeing how housing acts as a moderator and mediator um, to produce kind of adverse health outcomes. Uh, and so, you know, thinking about structural inequality really rooted in racism and classism and what people are afforded opportunity, how people are afforded housing opportunities or not, uh, really kind of embedded in who they are, what they look like, what these kind of group dynamics are like, and how space is ultimately segmented, and how that's entrenched by exclusionary policies uh, and practices both kind of historical in nature and also uh, in everyday active practice uh, on a contemporary basis. Well, so what does that look like? That ultimately translates into limited availability of housing, uh, especially for certain groups, the concentration of disadvantage um, in certain areas and opportunity on the other side, uh, because inequality has two sides. Uh, the limited ab ability to develop financial resources and wealth uh, through housing uh, are just some of the mechanisms by which um, these kind of structural um, components end up translating in the housing uh, realm. And then uh, the pillars of housing, which I'll describe in more detail um, in the following slide as well, 
um, have to do with neighborhood factors, housing conditions and quality, housing affordability, and residential stability. Um, so thinking about how these interact with one another and affect one another. Um, that ultimately, um, these pillars, um, you know, kind of serve to modulate um, health in different ways. Uh, one way is differential vulnerability due to chronic stress. Um, and that chronic stress can come from the conditions themselves, the affordability, or the cumulative impacts of a number of the housing um, kind of pillars. Uh, the ability to acquire resources that promote health, um, and some of that is also looking further upstream, even including um, educational opportunities, differential vulnerabilities across the life course that are manifested as a result of um, these uh, kind of housing pillars, and then health behaviors such as smoking and physical activity, which are in some ways determined by the built environment. Uh, and what's available in the retail landscape in certain areas. And what that ultimately looks like um, are health outcomes around general health status, um, mortality, um, and, and then morbidity around chronic diseases, infectious disease, maternal and reproductive health, um, and sexual health, as well as injury and mental health. So really kind of the gamut of health outcomes uh, are impacted by um, by housing. Uh, and, and I'll just uh, introduce these pillars of housing um, using alliteration, next slide, um, and maybe hopefully an easier way for you to understand way, how they are kind of connected um, in thinking about cost, conditions, consistency, and context. The cost being about housing affordability, which in the U.S., um, is really, um, you know, is, is, is measured by whether or not people spend more or less than uh, a third of their household income on housing, housing quality, which are really about uh, the kind of environmental hazards um, that impact safety, decency, and sanitary conditions, residential really instability being the more problematic part of uh, this kind of consistency um, realm. And that's the ability to kind of maintain residents voluntarily, especially over time um, and where mobility is determined by choice um, rather than these kind of push factors or pull factors um, that uh, oftentimes uh, impede stability in housing. And then the neighborhood context. So we know so much um, in public health about neighborhood effects, uh, but those neighborhood effects really are kind of still impacting uh, things that are happening in home environments such that when people are living in neighborhoods that are considered to be unsafe, for instance, they're spending more time uh, at home. Um, in neighborhoods that are marked by opportunity, there are many more kind of amenities that are happening at the neighborhood level that allow for there to be kind of some offsets and some uh, alternatives uh, in terms of uh, where people spend uh, their time and what influences um, their lives and their health. Uh, and so now I'll turn it over uh, to Carolyn to kind of go into more depth on, on the pillars and some examples. Great, thanks so much for that overview and introduction, Diana. Um, and likewise, I've been very fortunate um, to be able to collaborate with you and um, to benefit from your mentorship. Um, Diana and I worked on this project together a few years ago, so it's really exciting to be able to come together and talk about it with all of you. Um, likewise, I'm thrilled that there's so much interest in this topic, that it's resonated so much um, with so many people, um, especially in, in another country. Um, so really looking forward to the discussion with all of you today. All right. Um, so as Diana said, um, I will be overviewing um, the different housing pillars. Um, so going into further depth about each one of these four pillars um, and how they impact health. Um, and then after that, I'll also go into some more detail um, about the different historical processes that give rise to housing disparities that shape the reasons why so consistently across these very different pillars, uh, we still see health disparities along the same axes of inequality. 
So the first pillar that I'll discuss with you um, is housing conditions and quality. So as you can see on the right side of the slide here, um, there's really quite a range of, of different physical housing conditions which can contribute to poorer health. Um, so I won't go into all of them in depth, but to uh, give you a sense of, of how they operate, I'll discuss a couple in more detail. So one example is that inability to maintain thermal comfort in hot or cold conditions can affect residents' health by interfering with the body's ability to thermoregulate. And then that can contribute to physical health outcomes, including high blood pressure or respiratory conditions, and also contribute to poor mental health uh, from having to live through these conditions. Lower income residents are disproportionately affected as they're more likely not only to experience more difficulty affording energy bills, but also to live in energy inefficient homes that are more difficult to warm. Another example uh, is that pests like cockroaches um, can cause and trigger attacks of allergic sensitization and eventually asthma. And pest prevalence is higher in the homes of marginalized populations, um, likely because they're more likely to live in uh, more dilapidated housing that allows for pest entry. So these health conditions are also more common among these groups. So across all of these different conditions um, that you, you see here, uh, marginalized populations are more likely to experience older deteriorated housing stock, outdated infrastructure, deferred maintenance. Often this is exacerbated by unequal power dynamics between landlords and tenants. So altogether, all of these factors increase their risk of exposure to these harmful conditions. The second pillar is housing costs, it's affordability. So that includes not just difficulty paying your rent or mortgage payments, but also additional costs like property taxes or water or utility services. And affordability has a number of direct and indirect pathways to health. In terms of its, its potential direct impacts, living in unaffordable housing has been associated with outcomes such as poor self-rated health, with hypertension, uh, with arthritis, and unsurprisingly with mental health, right? Because the experience of, of struggling to pay for your housing is very stressful. Additionally, unaffordability can impact health indirectly um, by draining financial resources that otherwise folks could use for their health-related needs. Um, for example, health, health services or prescriptions, healthy food um, or child development resources. People may also turn to doubling up um, to make housing more affordable, right, crashing with a friend or a family member. But living in crowded spaces can have an adverse effect on your mental health um, from, from having to share these cramped spaces all the time. And especially for children, it can be difficult, for example, not, not having a quiet space to work on schoolwork. And following up on Diana's point that these pillars aren't isolated from one another, um, I just want to flag, as this image suggests, that housing affordability also has a relationship with the neighborhood where it's located. And it's also very uh, closely linked with residential stability, the next pillar I'll discuss. Um, and I'll discuss at, at the end of our um, conversation about pillars how they interact um, in, in more detail. So our third pillar is residential stability, um, which encompasses residents' capacity to willingly remain in their homes free from harassment or dispossession. Although people often think of a dichotomy where uh, people are either housed or homeless, there's actually quite a wide spectrum of insecure housing arrangements that we can think of short of homelessness, right? Including forced displacement from homes or communities, overcrowding or doubling up, difficulty paying for housing costs or frequent moves. Um, so I think this um, diagram um, by Rachel Cleet and her colleagues um, really effectively shows this um, progression um, from being stably housed to ultimately homeless and the gradations in between. While individuals may move voluntarily for many reasons, uh, maybe for a new job or a larger home, or uh, they want to uh, live in a different neighborhood, right? There are also a number of reasons uh, that involuntarily moves or displacement could occur. Um, so some examples are inability to afford rising rents, um, eviction, foreclosure, landlord harassment that makes it impossible to stay in your home, um, natural disasters, especially relevant um, in an era of the increasing threat of climate change, or certain uh, government policies like transformation of, of social housing, which I know has been um, a, an ongoing process in Canada as well as in the U.S. 
Um, and displacement, of course, can have adverse mental health impacts due to stress, right? It's very, very stressful um, being forced to move and having to set up a new life somewhere else. It can also have indirect effects, right? As it's disrupting employment, it's disrupting access to health relevant resources in your community, uh, maybe your connection to your healthcare providers, maybe your connections to social supports um, that uh, help reduce stress and help manage daily needs. Um, and then we could also think about the health impacts related to where people move. They might go um, to poorer quality housing or to uh, less healthful neighborhoods, especially if they're in an emergency and they just need to find new housing fast, um, or if they've already expended their limited resources on moving and need something very cheap, um, or if they've been evicted and now have a more difficult time persuading a landlord to accept them as a tenant. Um, and I also want to flag that children and adolescents are particularly vulnerable to um, some of these impacts of residential instability. Um, it, it's been linked um, for these populations with poor overall health, with uh, developmental and behavioral problems, and with lower school readiness and educational outcomes. So the final pillar um, is context or factors about the neighborhood in which housing is situated. So this can include things like the built environment, um, the availability of health-related resources like healthy food, um, environmental burdens, or social characteristics, to name a few uh, kind of overall categories. And there's huge differences in how these characteristics are distributed across neighborhoods, uh, corresponding to place-based disparities in health that we see so, um, so strongly across neighborhoods. A common saying in the U.S. now is that your zip code can actually be a better predictor of your health uh, than your genetic code. Uh, I'm not sure what the equivalent would be to a zip code in Canada, but um, it's a sort of small neighborhood scale uh, geographic unit. Um, so a few specific examples here. Um, so robust evidence demonstrates that environmental hazards like industrial sites or highways are disproportionately cited in low-income communities uh, and or communities of color, exposing residents to environmental toxins, uh, which of course are associated with many, many um, adverse health outcomes from pollution. Um, additionally, reliable and affordable public transportation can um, affect people's access to health care and provide means to secure employment, to engage in other health-related activities, um, and also walkable neighborhoods and neighborhoods with uh, green spaces, parks, playgrounds, um, all of that can help encourage physical activity and thereby reduce risk of obesity or related chronic conditions. And finally, neighborhood institutions, um, such as retail stores and local services, as Diana mentioned, can also affect health. Um, for example, um, having supermarkets available rather than just convenience stores, right, is strongly associated with a healthy diet rich in fruits and vegetables um, and therefore with lower rates of obesity. But neighborhoods with low income and racialized residents disproportionately have more fast food outlets and lack retailers selling health and freshy food, fresh and healthy food. And we see similar retail trends um, with tobacco and liquor, where they're more likely to um, be widely available in marginalized neighborhoods. So I've talked about how all of these different housing characteristics across each of the four pillars is associated with certain health outcomes, right? But I also want to add some important nuance here that any one housing exposure doesn't automatically equate to a certain amount of risk or a certain outcome for a couple main reasons. Um, first, lots of relevant uh, social and housing factors can moderate or mediate any given exposure's effects. People have different vulnerability across the life course, for example, where um, infants and young children are especially uh, susceptible to environmental exposures as are older adults. Another example is that other forms of social inequality and vulnerability may also affect the same health outcomes as a particular housing exposure or multiple housing exposures that, that people are also experiencing. Structural racism and exposure to discrimination and to constant daily hassles can contribute to what's called weathering or wear and tear on your physiological systems that can affect um, all different kinds of health outcomes. So that could actually amplify a housing exposure's effects if it's, if it's working on the same particular health outcome. 
And also, as Diana mentioned, our behaviors can influence how we engage with the health exposure or how it affects us. And the second reason that we can't just assume given exposure equals given outcome is that the housing pillars don't exist in isolation from one another, right? Because housing disparities have this common origin in structural inequalities, the same marginalized groups that experience these inequalities are likely to be burdened with or to be vulnerable to multiple different adverse housing exposures at the same time. And additionally, residents with limited resources may have to make trade-offs in their housing choices, accepting hazards in one domain in order to achieve stability in others, like choosing a less expensive home in a more affordable neighborhood, but one that has fewer health-promoting resources in the neighborhood. So if you make changes in one pillar, you can also cause disruption in another. For example, if you improve housing quality or if you remediate toxic exposures in a neighborhood, is it going to raise housing costs and cause housing instability? So two implications from, from the um, uh, facts on this slide. So the first is all of these multiple exposures might have a cumulative impact, which is compounding and exponential rather than additive. And the second is that the housing pillars aren't totally independent, but multiple pillars can be relevant for the same person. And changing one pillar can impact other pillars. So when we're thinking about solutions, when we're thinking about designing interventions, we have to be careful about thinking, you know, if this one thing is changed, it will automatically have this particular effect. And instead, we need to think about housing related factors as a web that we have to address holistically and in a way that's attentive to social context. So I'm going to talk more now about why we see these persistent disparities along axes of inequality across uh, all of these different pillars. So this is the first half of our model um, on the left here, the structural roots of housing disparities and the mechanisms through which they eventually come to impact housing and health. The unequal burden of housing disparities that we've been referencing throughout that marginalized populations are, are bearing didn't occur spontaneously or naturally across all of these different pathways, right? But rather it's related to broader structural disadvantage that's enforced by individuals and institutions. So we outlined in the paper um, some of these specific policies and practices in the U.S. context. Historically, um, in the U.S. and I would imagine in Canada as well, which I'd love to discuss more in the Q&A, uh, marginalized groups were denied full control over their residential choices through racist and economically exclusionary ideologies, which created segregated landscapes of uneven resources and opportunity, right? So some specific policies in the U.S., for example, were racial covenants, redlining, exclusionary zoning, and the destruction of neighborhoods to rebuild them during urban renewal. In the present, uh, we see housing disparities continuing to be reinforced um, through processes such as gentrification, shifts in federal housing assistance policies, subprime loan targeting, and housing discrimination, just to name a few. So altogether, these policies limited access to decent habitable housing and health promoting neighborhoods among non-white and lower income groups. Um, and again, some of this is pretty specific to the U.S. history and legal system, right? But I'm showing them here as an example um, because I imagine that the same general principle holds true in Canada as well, even if the specific unequal policies and practices in the Canadian context are different. Uh, and again, would welcome thoughts and comments from anyone during the Q&A about um, what some of those um, specific policies uh, might be and any differences that you observe um, from, from in the U.S., uh, for example, we know housing disparities for Indigenous uh, Indigenous peoples are a pressing issue in Canada, as they are in the U.S., um, and it would be great to hear from you all about policies that might have contributed in the Canadian context. So how did these policies and practices translate into differentiated opportunities for healthy housing? 
So first, segregationist policies which spatially concentrate marginalized groups make it easier to distribute resources along those axes of inequality, to disinvest in these places where people who are the most marginalized live, and to instead concentrate health-promoting resources in more resourced, um, more advantaged neighborhoods. Second, limiting housing options available to poor residents generally, and in the U.S. context, um, in particular, this has been true for Black residents, constrain them to unaffordable, unstable, and poor quality housing. A dual housing market was, in essence, created in which high demand for limited supply of housing in the restricted neighborhoods available to Black people allowed landlords to charge high rents for overcrowded and poorly maintained units. And finally, unequal access to home equity prevented uh, wealth accumulation across generations. This limited marginalized groups' ability to afford healthy housing and achieve housing security with intergenerational impacts, and also saddled them with poorer health associated with lower socioeconomic status. So with that overview, um, now I'm going to walk through a few specific examples of housing policies which are linked to health disparities. And I'm also going to be attentive to the implications for interventions of how these structural inequities uh, have shaped a web of exposures in people's lives. Um, so the first example is redlining. Um, so this refers to deeming certain neighborhoods to be unworthy of credit and denying them investment and resources. Often in the U.S. it refers specifically um, to the practices of a couple government agencies, the Homeowners Loan Corporation and the Federal Housing Administration uh, in the 1930s, which were supposed to be shoring up um, the housing market after the Great Depression. So they conducted these widespread neighborhood appraisals of investment risk and created these color-coded residential security maps, um, which ranked neighborhoods from A, best, to D, hazardous. And these assessments explicitly considered neighborhood residents' race and ethnicity. So the presence of people of color, immigrant, um, and or Jewish residents uh, was typically considered detrimental. So on the right here, you can see an example um, for the city of Philadelphia, where I'm from, um, that the inner city uh, is largely D-rated, colored in red, red lining, while the farther out you go, the more you see green, uh, the more likely it is to be white residents living in more expensive single-family homes. And many studies have found an association between redlining and present day outcomes across all kinds of environmental characteristics and health outcomes. And just to highlight one in particular, um, this study, which came out recently, um, found that nitrogen dioxide is associated with historical redlining grade in this very clear and striking gradient um, from A to D uh, on the left here. Um, and we talked earlier, right, about how environmental hazards are disproportionately located in low-income communities of color, how pollutant levels are disproportionately higher there. And here we see that these inequities have these long-standing roots in uh, the history of, of spatial racism. Um, so here's another example in the present day, which focuses on that question of interaction between the different pillars. Um, so implementing new green amenities in a neighborhood um, like the High Line here in New York seems great, right? We all love parks. I love parks. You love parks. We know parks are linked to some improved health outcomes like physical activity. But a new body of, of research looking at what's called green gentrification or eco gentrification points out that these new amenities may not be accessible to all residents equally, and they may have other effects that can adversely impact vulnerable residents' health. In particular, they could contribute to rising housing costs as wealthier residents move into a neighborhood that is now more attractive. And so long-term residents could be priced out, struggle with affordability, ultimately be displaced. Um, as the researcher Isabel Angolovsky, who's doing really interesting work on this, um, points out in the quote on the right, the marriage of urban redevelopment with greening creates a paradox, even while greening certainly provides economic, ecological, and social benefits to many, it may create new and deeper vulnerabilities for some. So here we see that making a change that seems good for health in one pillar, neighborhood conditions, can actually have an adverse effect on another pillar, affordability. And we also see that it's really important to consider social context because structural inequality both led to a lack of green space before 
the parks were introduced, right, as well as made the neighborhood's prior residents more vulnerable to exclusion as the neighborhood gentrified. Also in the present day, uh, my last example, eviction is a policy which not only directly contributes to poor health, but also perpetuates disparities in access to healthy housing moving forward. One analysis of, of low-income mothers, for example, found that evicted mothers were more likely to have depression and to, work, to report worse overall health for both themselves and their children. And other studies have also found higher risk of adverse birth outcomes, of sexually transmitted infections, of depressive symptoms, um, of disruption to healthcare access. And in the context of a pandemic, of course, eviction can make it more likely that you'll be exposed to crowded environments and more difficult to comply with mitigation strategies like quarantining or social distancing. And furthermore, eviction makes it more difficult to subsequently rent a home, especially a healthy one, as landlords often refuse to rent to tenants uh, with eviction records. As one legal analysis put it, in fact, any tenant who has been named in an eviction proceeding is effectively barred uh, from obtaining safe, decent, and healthy housing. Um, and eviction is very prevalent. Uh, in Canada, for example, 7% of people report being evicted in the past. And eviction is also um, unsurprisingly disproportionately experienced by marginalized groups. Of course, low-income people are more likely to struggle to pay their rent and to be evicted for that reason. But there are also disparities by racialized groups. In Canada, as you can see um, in, this, in this graphic, um, Indigenous people and Black people are almost twice as likely to report an eviction. So eviction can really contribute to the health disparities experienced by these groups. So to summarize what we covered so far, there are a myriad of ways that our homes and neighborhoods, physical and social environments, can support or harm our health, spanning our four main pillars of condition, cost, consistency, and context. The opportunity to access healthy housing across all four pillars is not randomly distributed, um, but rather we see significant disparities along axes of inequality, which are rooted in historical and ongoing policies and practices which promote segregation and exclusion. For this reason, the same people may be at risk of unhealthy housing exposures across multiple pillars, and other exposures related to inequality can also amplify unhealthy housing's effects. So we need to avoid assuming that a given change will have a particular impact because of these interactions. It could disrupt another pillar, uh, for example, and so rather it's important to think about housing exposures as part of a web of interrelated variables emerging from the same roots of structural inequalities. So I've spent a lot of time talking about how housing can be harmful to our health, um, right, and how it contributes to health disparities, but housing has just as much potential to be a platform for improving health and equity. Um, so with that, I'll turn it over to Diana to talk about what would a bit vision be to change that relationship? And, uh, and this is really kind of the last section before opening up for questions. And so we invite you to start to prepare um, questions. Thank you so much, um, Carolyn, for providing uh, that very detailed um, overview uh, of the pillars and, and some contemporary ex uh, examples. If you could just go to the next slide. Um, and I'll just um, kind of uh, say that at, at some point, um, you know, while we while we must kind of pay attention to the realities and sometimes those realities are problematic um, and a, a key step to justice is recognition. Uh, we, we also um, believe that housing has incredible potential uh, for transforming people's lives, uh, for uh, stabilizing uh, their existence and really launching uh, their life chances. Um, and if we just spent a little bit of time kind of re-envisioning housing for health equity, it would really focus on this kind of intersection of people, places, and policies such that health equity and housing would entail opportunities for all individuals, regardless of race, ethnicity, socioeconomic status, household composition, zip code or postal code uh, to benefit from developments in modern building science, fair maintenance practices, community planning, and creative uses of space through programming to foster a culture of health and social connectedness 
where people live. And so with that, we'd like to kind of uh, invite opportunities for engagement uh, and questions um, and learn also uh, more about the kind of local context in Canada, if, if possible. Uh, thank you. Wonderful. Thank you both so much. I'll just ask you to